Um, hello, my name is April Sweeney, and this is my colleague, Brenda Worth. And we really want to welcome you uh, today, coming to the Siegel Center. Thank you for your time. Uh, we're incredibly pleased to um, present to you two excerpts of a new work by Argentine playwright Romina Paola. And we're incredibly lucky that Romina could be here with us today. Um, so the evening is going to consist of a short uh, sort of introduction uh, that my colleague Brenda has written about Romina's work, um, followed by an excerpt of a play called The Whole of Time, translated by Jean Graham Jones, then followed by an excerpt of a play entitled Fauna, uh, translated by Brenda and myself, and then there'll be a tiny little video, uh, in case our eyes are wanting, um, of Romina's work. And then we're gonna have a discussion with Romina, sort of a question and answer uh, <laughs> that will we'll kind of start off with a couple of questions for Romina, but we hope will stimulate thoughts in you guys, in the audience here, and that you guys will participate. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is a very brief uh, introduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to the Siegel Center and to Frank Henschger for allowing all of this to happen. <laughs> Yes, uh, thanks to Mike and thanks to uh, Tony Torn and um, thanks also to April for directing and to all the actors for offering your time so generously to be with us this evening. And thank you for your warm welcome of Romina Paola. Um, I'm gonna sit down, this is brief, but I am gonna sit down. Um, so we are so excited and honored to have with us this evening Romina Paola and to have the opportunity to present her extraordinary plays, Fauna and the Whole of Time, translated into English also for the first time. She has received overwhelming praise and critical acclaim for her dramaturgical work and has toured internationally throughout Latin America and Europe, taking part in numerous festivals, including the Festival Itinerarte, the Teatro du Ronde, uh, Santiago de Mil, Napoli Teatro Festival, and the Festival du Tom in Paris. Paula's plays are beautifully crafted and metatheatrically rich explorations of art, love, gender, sexuality, and family. She establishes unexpected and thrilling dialogue with a range of interlocutors, including Rainer Maria Rilke, Sarah Ruhl, Tennessee Williams, Roberto Alt, Frida Kahlo, Chabuca Granda, Lucha Reyes, Caspar David Friedrich, the cast of Six Feet Under. That's actually from her narrative, but I thought I would add it because it's very funny. Um, as playwrights, theater director, film actor, filmmaker, and novelist, she embodies the versatility of a new generation of Argentine artists working in and across genres of theater, film, dance, photography, the visual arts, and literature. She recently wrote and directed her first film, Again, Once Again, uh, which premiered in March of this year, and she is well known for her performances in Matias Pinedo's masterful Shakespeare-inspired film trilogy, Viola, the Princess of France, and Hermia and Helena. This has been a very busy year for Romina. She also just premiered the play Reynos, a collective collaboration with artists Agustina Munoz and Margarita Molfino in October at the Sarmiento Theater in Buenos Aires. Based on the diary of Molfino's grandmother, written between 1934 and 1942, the play provides an intimate exploration of gender, work, and nature, but turns specifically to the question of inheritance and how certain experiences, expectations, and forms of knowledge are inherited and discarded over time and across generations. Paola's trajectories as playwright and novelist have similarly developed in tandem, and today is she considered a central figure both to a new generation of theater makers and a new generation of women writers in women novelists in Argentina. The work of this generation expresses new perspectives on gender, sexuality, and reproductive rights that resonate with transnational movements such as Ni Una Menos, The Green Wave, Me Too, and the emergence of fourth wave feminism. Her novel, August, was translated into English by Jennifer Croft and published by the Feminist Press at CUNY in 2017. Though in many ways, Paola's work is representative of a new generation of interdisciplinary artists, her theater marks a notable departure from the significant body of work that emerged in the 90s exploring documentary modes and the real. First, in Bibi Telas' work, and a decade later, in the work of Lola Arias, Federico Leon, Mariano Pensotti, and Grupo Cra, among others. Paola's work engages questions of the real, but explores more powerfully the limitless potential of fiction. She is less interested in destabilizing the fictional frame than she is in creating intimacy through the joint exploration with the audience of what constitutes art, acting, experience, and identity. 
Paola's plays imagine words that are both poetically expansive and intimate. The stories she tells are complex, yet create unexpected and emotionally intense connections between characters and audiences. She moves us to think about how we tell the stories of people's lives and the role of art in defining our ideas of love, family, and gender. Her plays stretch and collapse the time between past and present through a sophisticated interweaving of literary texts, myths, fairy tales, visual art, and music. She invites us to reflect on the passage of time and how this current global moment encompasses both the enduring patterns of structural violence and gender inequity, as well as the radical changes in perceptions and practices of family, gender, and sexual just sexuality justice that have revolutionized the public sphere in Argentina, <coughs> the US, and around the world. Um, I would now like to turn it over to Jean Graham Jones, uh, who will do uh, a brief introduction of the whole of time. I'll keep this brief because I'm really excited to see what Tony and Jose have done with, the, with my translation. So, but when I saw El Tiempo Todo Entero in Buenos Aires in 2009, 2010, 2011, it ran for four years. I saw it twice and I don't remember which years. Um, it, it did knock me flat with its intensity, depth, and radical approach to a modern classic. Paola's play takes inspiration from Tennessee Williams' Glass Menagerie, but I would hesitate to call this even a version as it goes in such remarkably different directions. For one, focusing on Antonia's active agency rather than Laura's limitations. The four characters vaguely resemble William's mother, daughter, son, and gentleman caller. But the play takes the story out of Tom's memory and into Antonia's active decision to stay home, which in turn generates a different relationship to the outside world, to family, to art, and to time. It's a time that Romina Paola has called reflective, personal, and disconnected from our contemporary world's obsession with productivity. That's why I've translated the title somewhat liberally as the whole of time to capture Antonia's and the play's concept of time as a whole and not fragmented into units, pasts, presents, futures. So I'll, keep, I'll close by simply echoing Brenda's comment about Romina Paola's creation of a joint intimacy between spectators and performers. I've experienced that joint intimacy not only while seeing the production in Buenos Aires, but also while translating the play nearly 10 years later. Romina's words took me right back to the original's caged set, the emotional intensity of the actors, and while engaging, re-engaging with the text, performances and key moments kept flashing vividly into my head. And the lines that were spoken years earlier resonated in my ears and the voices of those first actors. So for me as a translator, and I've translated some 25 Argentine plays into English, it was a remarkable experience to translate this play. It was an experience of physical, emotional, and mental recall. And I say all that to convey how exceptional I think Romina Paola's theater is, and I'm really happy she's here tonight to celebrate that with us. Thank you.
grow. Now, Blaise says, yours? Yeah, it's our mother's. And ours, too? So where? Where what? Your mom. Ours. Oh, yeah, but she lives here. Yeah, it's her place. Oh, and that's your dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Frida Kahlo's father. Oh. It's a picture, painted. Yeah, I can tell it's a painting. <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying is that we have it there like a painting because it's a painting, a picture. Yeah, I get it, a picture, because you all like it or what? My mom brought it here when we came back from Mexico. You were in Mexico? We're Mexican. We were born there. What? Your mom's Mexican? No, but she lived there for a while. Uh-huh, and your old man. Anyway, it's an art background to somebody. That's why we like it. She usually painted portraits of herself. Hey, he doesn't look Mexican. Because he isn't. He was Hungarian. The Austrian. She loves him very much. He was a photographer. But she killed herself, right? The painter? Frida? Yeah. Not at all. She died from an accident she had when she was young. She spent her whole life dying. I thought she was one of those who committed suicide. No. Well, even though her death is a little fussy, some say she took a cocktail of pills mixed with morphine for the pain. <laughs> because, because her body was beaten to a thousand pieces. But that's not the official version. She got tired of it. No, I don't know anything about her. Well, wasn't she kind of a hippie? Hippie? <laughs> <laughs> you mean because of her clothes? That's traditional Mexican clothing. It is really sophisticated. Woven on a loom and hand embroidered. I didn't know. Shocking. But why was her body split? She had an accident when she was young. She was in a trolley bus. Uh, what? They're like trams. Just like my sister needs to like to use strange words. It's not strange. <laughs> That's what it's called. <laughs> Are you interested in this story? It's a little gruesome. Yeah, I'm interested. Well, she was in a tram. Trolley bus, Antonia. And a car ran into them, and a handbell was driven into her groin. She was impaled on it. It went right through her. She almost died. It was a miracle that she didn't. But her spine was gravely injured, and she had to undergo infinite operation throughout her entire life. And she was in a cast and confined bed for years at a time. Every so often, she had a relapse. Poor thing. Not poor thing. She was Frida Kahlo. <laughs> she did all of her paintings in that situation. I think she had a beautiful life, despite her physical suffering. Mm. She had a great sense of humor. Maybe that's what saved her. Oh, yeah? Yeah, on some of her paintings. Actually, a lot of them, she put some title, or elusive, or exclamatory names, and the majority are very comical. I painted my father, Wilhelm Kahlo. Well, not that one. You like paintings, too? Yeah. Not as much as my sister does. So we can go whenever you want. OK, relax. I only have 20 pages left. Do you mind? No. Uh, go ahead and read. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it? Any good? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, it's good. Uh, what's it about? <laughs> There's a whaling ship that's going after a white killer whale. An adventure story. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's good, you say? Yeah, it's good. What does she do? Antonia? Yeah, what does she do? What's your job? Ask her. No, it doesn't matter. Antonia? Huh? No, I just asked your brother what you did. With what? I don't know, with your life. You mean like a profession? Yeah, I don't know. What do you do? Nothing. What, what do you mean, nothing? Yeah, nothing. At least according to the terms you're asking me. Nothing. But you don't work? Mm -mm. You study? No, do you mean at the university? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> well, you must do something. No, I don't believe in doing. In what way? In the way of doing. Doing for its own sake. Something, anything. I don't believe in that. Like working? For example, I don't understand why they do those things. Working, going to school, traveling, going out. 
but you must do something. You're over there at the computer. You talk. Yeah. You, for example, you're, you're talking with me now. Those are all strictly non-productive things. Right? You think so? <laughs> Antonio doesn't go out. You don't go out? She doesn't like to leave her home. She doesn't leave her home? <laughs> no. She doesn't go outside? No. Like she doesn't go out on the sidewalk? No. Don't you want to go outside? I don't know. Ask Lorenzo. <laughs> Excuse me, would you mind if we listen to some music? Yes, we can. Would, would it bother you if I put on a song? No. <laughs> oh, but do you want to? It's all the same to me. <laughs> would you rather we talk? bad you don't go out. Why? Because you're pretty. How so? I don't know, to me. I think you're pretty. Okay. You're a person who could be normal. <laughs> who could have a normal life. You know, I don't know, go out, meet people. Why? But to get to know them, talk, have experiences. I don't know. But you're afraid. Afraid? I don't think so. I'm not interested. How do you know? Because I used to go out on the streets, and then I quit going out. Why? Because I didn't want to do it anymore. I just started staying here, inside. Well, but didn't they send you to psychologist or something? <laughs> no. I don't know, your brother, your mom. No, they love me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Like this. They love me the way I am. I'm like this. Like how? You seem really smart to me. Okay. No, seriously, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that nobody knows you. <laughs> Why? Because it's a waste, because you're a nice person. Mm. Smart <laughs> and pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a waste. I don't like to go out. Mm -hmm. I don't like people in general. I like my brother and my mom. Oh, you get along with your mom? No. So, is there anything I can do for you <coughs> to make you want to go out? No. Nothing. You already know that. Is that I don't want to go out. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me like that anymore. It bothers me. <laughs> if you want, you can come here and we talk. About, but about other things. Not about staying or leaving. This is who I am. I am this way. Well, don't you think it's sad? Sad? For who? For you? I don't think so. I'm not sad. If you think this is sad, it is because you think something else is, I don't know, happy? <laughs> what seems happy to you? What do you like to do? Me? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I like talking to people. I like having free time. So? Mm -hmm. What? All my time is what you call free. Mm -hmm. huh? No, 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 no. But no, I like having free time because it's free, because the other time is busy. And if the other time isn't busy, what is it? I don't know. Wasted? Oh. Wasted. Yeah. What is wasted time? The time you are not working? No, that's my free time. Oh. <laughs> wasted time is mine then, for example. I don't know. Maybe. And what it would be not wasting it? What would be not wasting it? Making money? No, oh, even if it's not making money, doing something. I don't know, even if it's something you like to do. Well, I like to listen to music, be at the computer, and read, and sing, and be with my mom, and with my brother too, and now with you, and then I do some chores, and I sleep, and I dream. That's what I do with my time. Okay, fine. <laughs> Matti? What? What's your day like? My day? Mm -hmm. A typical day, for example. You mean a typical day? Uh, Tell me about your day. <laughs> I don't do anything. I go to work and then I come home or I go out. Everything, everything. 
today? What uh, time do you get up? Oh, <coughs> everything. Uh, <coughs> well, the alarm goes off at 8.30, and I turn over a couple of times, and then it goes off again at 9, and then I get up. Mm. Every day? Yeah, every day, except for Mondays, which is when I have off. Mondays or Tuesdays, they change them around on me. You wake up at 9? Yeah, I get up. And what's the very first thing you do when you wake up? Uh, usually I take a shower. No, but don't you do anything before that? You wake up, and the first thing you do is just jump in the shower. Uh, no, the first thing I do is I turn on the radio. Yeah, I get up and click. I turn on the radio. AM or FM? FM. I turn on the radio. <laughs> I put on the water for my coffee. I go take a leak, wait for the water to get ready, drink a few sips of coffee, and then I get into the shower. Yeah, I don't do much else. I drink my coffee, check my email, I get dressed, and around 10, I'm heading out the door. You don't eat anything? No, I eat lunch at 11.30 at the grill. They feed us there. Oh, of course, of course. School? I work until around 5, and then it depends. Sometimes I go back home, other times I go for a walk, or I meet up with someone. Thursdays, I go play soccer, I get to eat with the guys from the, the grill. It depends. And if you go home after work? I hardly ever go home right away. Okay, but if you do? Well, if I do, it's because I'm tired. So I take a nap and watch TV. And then later afterwards, I make something to eat uh, or have it delivered. And out of those days, those weeks, which moment, which time would it be what you call free? <laughs> Let's see, from when I leave work. Yeah, from when I leave work until I have to go back. Even though I don't really count the mornings because I'm, I'm getting up and ready to go out. If I go to bed really late or drunk or something, I don't even make my coffee. I just get up and leave. Go out into the world. In other words, during your free time, what you like to be at home watching television and sleeping. And that's what you enjoy. That's what you like to do. Yeah, yeah, that too. You know, other times I go out. It's what I already told you. Okay. So what do you find when you're out on walking, walking around? What do you mean, what do I find? During your free time, walking around on the street, uh, what do you find? What do you like about that? I don't know. Hmm. Spending a nice moment with somebody, talking about something, you're drinking a beer, maybe hooking up, walking around, seeing the city, the people. Sometimes things happen, strange things. You know, you happen to run into somebody by chance, sometimes, not very often. But if you go out, then that's a possibility. You know, getting to know someone new also, I don't know. You meet a lot of people in the street. Well, no. You met me here, here, inside. And I met you here, too. I meet people here. And the people who come here are usually invited by my brother, my mom, or me. And what do they say? About what? About you not going out. Nothing. They know. Are you really worried about my not going out? Does it disturb you that much? You want me to tell you the truth? Please. I can't believe it. <laughs> Why such a big deal? Well, I didn't even know that Lorenzo had a sister. What does that have to do with it? You must not have asked him. If I had gone out, you probably wouldn't have known me either. <clears throat> that doesn't have anything to do with my not going out. I like to be here. Do you see this as a problem? I believe it is a problem. According to? I think a doctor would say so. A psychologist? For example. <laughs> it depends on what you're expecting in reality. In what way? You think I'm crazy for staying here, inside. I seem crazy to you. No, you don't seem crazy to me. So, but... But, but people who go to a psychologist are crazy people. Everybody has uh, some issue to resolve, something to get an answer for, and they go... Uh, they go with something that's causing them distress, and they go to the psychologist because it helps them be better. I don't know. Do you go to the psychologist? No. <laughs> you never went? No. <laughs> <laughs> so then? Well, I don't know. I, I never had to. I never felt that bad. Oh, but I do. I feel bad. I don't know. Do you feel bad? I don't know. Everyone, but not like thinking when I'm bad or I need to resolve something or oh, something is a problem. Okay. Do I tell you that your life is weird and you ought to be another way and you seem weird to me because you go to work in the same place every day and you wait on people and you feed them 
only so you can feel just bad enough in order to feel good later. When you are at work, I don't need that kind of contrast in, or, in order to cope with the time. I cope with all my time, the whole of my time, nonstop. So what do you live on? The money my mom earns mm. and some of what my brother brings in. And that doesn't make you feel bad? What? Your brother works, you don't. No, my mom is enough to live on. And my brother works because he wants to. But he contributes. Because he wants to. I'm getting bored. I thought you were a little less normal. Sorry. <laughs> What's up? Don't you feel him sometimes? The boogeyman? Is that a saying? No. Yeah. It's a hole here inside. Do you feel it? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I don't call it boogeyman. You talking about being afraid? It's fear. But it's also something else. Do you follow? No. I don't know, matter. but why are you telling me this? It doesn't matter. Yeah, it interests me. Has to do with what we were talking about before. Not going out. I love you. No. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Seahawks sailed with sheathed beaks. On the second day, a sail drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel that in her retracing search after her missing children only found another orphan. Beneath. Beautiful. Oh, thank God you're alive! Awake, Mom. Thank God we're awake. Yes! Thank God. <laughs> this is Maximiliano from the grill. Hello. <laughs> now, I'm going to greet you properly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Lorenzo's friend. You a waiter, too? He works at the bar. I mix the drink. Oh, bartender! Oh, how wonderful, how much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to study for that? Hmm? Do you have a signature cocktail or something that you're particularly good at? A favorite, something that everybody orders? My uh, Bloody Marys are great. <laughs> but with tomato juice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't like drinks with a lot of pulp. No. You know, they don't sit well with me. They're, they're, they're very seem heavy. If I want to get drunk, I don't feel like drinking a smoothie. 
<laughs> well, like that drink. What's the one uh, that's so popular these days? The one you made for my birthday. Daiquiri. It's like um, a fruit smoothie with alcohol. Daiquiri. Daiquiri, that's it. <laughs> and anyway, mm, and anyway, the fruit ferments <laughs> in the alcohol. And then what happens? Well, you get really drunk really fast. <laughs> Do you remember how we all ended up that day? Some worse than others. <laughs> you made daiquiris, Maximiliano. What an imperial name, hmm? Maximiliano. <laughs> it's a family name. My dad and my grandfather were named Maximiliano. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Women ask for it a lot. Ask for what? Daiquiris, Mom. <laughs> what were you just talking about? I just got a little dizzy. Okay, bring your mother something strong, Lorenzo. Bring me a digestif. I want one too. Maxi? Sure. Maxi? <laughs> Woo, Maxi! <laughs> yes, of course, because Maximiliano is really long. <laughs> oh, it's nice. It's such a nice name. It's worth staying the whole thing. I don't like drinking big fruit pop. <laughs> you like daiquiris? She had a ton on my birthday. Because Lorenzo made them, and there wasn't anything else, but I wouldn't choose it as an alcoholic beverage. I, I like long names. Lorenzo, Antonia. And I like to say the whole name, I like that. So I'm taking the time to name something, things. Your children. Especially my children. Antonia and Lorenzo are nice. Their names? Nice enough to say the whole names because they aren't diminutivable. Diminutivable. <laughs> yes, uh, from diminutive. They cannot be shortened. Anton. Lauren. It doesn't work. I like Anton. It's awful, honey. I like it. And besides, Anton could be Antonella, and Antonella is. Appalling! <laughs> it just so happens that my girlfriend's name's Antonella. Seriously? Yes, seriously. <sighs> Not just kidding. <laughs> 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 What would that be the problem? I mean, you had a girlfriend with an ugly name. That's that, right? Why would we get all worked up? Did you have a good
good trip? Yes, I'm, I'm good. It I'm, was long, but good. I really wanted to see. Did you tell her anything? Who, Louisa? Yes, did you tell her about us? Are you crazy? No, how did she know? I, uh, I don't know. She must have figured it out. What? Julia. I wanted to talk to you about it anyway. What? I prefer that we keep our distance here. Mm. Mm. What, what do you mean by distance? I mean distance. I mean, I think we should be work colleagues, and that's it. Mm. But why? I don't know. It's not good for me to mix everything. I prefer that we concentrate on the film, on Fama. Well, yes, of course, but I, what does that have to do with anything? I couldn't wait for you to get here to have you to myself for a while. That's what I mean. I won't be able to be all yours right now. Not even for a minute. I, I need to concentrate on the work and getting to know these people, who, from what I've seen, are interesting and very much worth our time. Well, I don't know what to say. Am I allowed to even give you a kiss? No. I don't understand why. I, I don't want to go on talking about this. I prefer we have a working relationship, a romance that evolves through our work. And of course, we can be friends. But if that's not possible, it's also not necessary. It's not clear to me when you started thinking this way. I've been thinking about it for a long time. On the bus right here, all the pieces kind of fell into place, and I knew I wanted to talk to you about it. Well, what you're telling me feels like a slap in the face. We came here to work. What? What does that have to do with anything? It has everything to do with everything. I don't want to think about anything else. I want to concentrate on this person, on her life, and nothing else. I don't want to have to wonder what it means if we're sleeping together or not, or if you're looking at me one way or the other. I just, I don't want to, I don't want to do it anymore. Well, that's fine with me. The film is the most important thing for me, too. Fantastic. Yes, fantastic. That woman is one of a kind. <laughs> a little invasive, don't you think? <laughs> invasive? No, it didn't seem that way to me at all. On the contrary, she seems intelligent, charismatic, charming. Well, you just met her. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Plus, there's something about her that's profoundly familiar, as if I'd known her forever. Like, in another life? Maybe. And it's not worth it for you to get upset about what I said. When the trip is over, we can talk again if you like. We'll see. What does we'll see mean? Two, a love so beautiful. <laughs> The artist! For a few minutes, they observe one another. Santos, Julia, and Jose Luis. If I have something for you artists that is real, something true. Have you ever staged a death? Or even witnessed one? Or is it necessary to imagine it? No. No, of course not. I am going to tell you about the death of something big. Something great. It is hot. And Melito and I go down to the river to bathe. We leave Lacey and Coco in the green pasture, in the shade. And as the heat intensifies, we jump into the river to cool off. We let the current drag us along as we swim downstream. And before we hit the sand bar, we return to the riverbank and the shade, each of us too exhausted to walk. Minito sleeps. I sleep. Later in the night, Monito awakens and I go with him. We walk back upstream. It is already dark. The green foliage is thick, and it's not easy for us to find our way nor to the animals we are searching for. 
Juanito hollers for Coco and I for Lacey. But there is nothing until a noise and he draws us near. It's buzzing, a steady droning. They are bees, Juanito says. And they are. And we want to leave, to go back. But Juanito gets closer. He hears the intense buzzing and sees the swarm of bees has attacked the horses and devoured them. No longer standing, they now lie motionless. Mares with still hearts, they walk no more. They want no more. The two bodies are even darker at night, engulfed by the bees that have left nothing. Not even a hair, nor a piece of flesh. Juanito jumps into the swarm, flailing his arms wildly, and sends the bees flying, making it so dark that I can't see. Then I wave a piece of clothing, and the bees take flight, sounding like an engine as they rise up together. While we entangle the mares from the rains that imprison them, the bees envelop us, and we retreat to the water and swim away. And only the water will stop them. There we are, in the cold of the night, in the water, swimming away in order to escape the bees and save ourselves from being devoured by them. Because they will not stop. Water Juanito seems to be for the mares, for the sweet mares, large, black, and lying together side by side, unmoving, and nothing can be done. But as you run, the stage cracked to reveal a flash of the reel, a fissure through which you departed. Green, real green. Real sunshine. Real forest. Taroka, translated by your mother. Yes. And you, hmm. how would you do it? With such a, a large horse lying motionless on the ground. It's a tragedy, but how would you do it? Do what? Represent the death, the horses. <laughs> ah, uh, no, I, I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> no. You don't know? No, I don't know anything about horses. Well, no, uh, very little. Do you want to go see the horses? Yes. No. I would go. To see the horses? What? What for? Well, you have to help me bury them. The horses? They have to be buried? Well, I can't do it by myself. The Monito isn't coming back. He ran off into the forest. We won't see him for a few days. We have to dig. Well, forgive me, but no, with all due respect, <laughs> Santos, because like I said, I don't have the slightest idea, but is it really necessary to bury them? I mean, what, what, what I mean is, aren't they already a part of nature? What I'm getting at is, isn't that more of a city thing? If we don't bury them, the weasels will eat them bit by bit and build nests inside. <laughs> okay. No. Yeah. Right. Well, I have no problem with that. We have to bury both of them, right? <laughs> Whenever you want, we'll do it. Now. At, at this moment now? <laughs> Night is the witching hour of the weasel. <laughs> Four. Bound. First rehearsal. that I don't know what you're talking about. Fauna, it's me. You seem like a good man, but please don't insist. I don't know who Fauna is. My name is Martina Cespedes, and you, sir, I've never seen you in my life. 
I don't understand why you wish to torture me like this, Fauna. I've already asked for your forgiveness. Sir, if you don't leave, I'm going to have to ask the Maitre d' to escort you out by force. Fauna! Please, forgive me. Do it for the love you once felt for me. Please, don't be ridiculous. What is this love you're talking about? Love. Presumptuous. Fauna, it's me! What happened to you? What have they done to you? Sir, please, I'm begging you. Cut. Cut. Very good, Santos. It's, it's good. Thank you. Juliet, listen to me. You have to, you have to raise the stakes. If not, it turns into a sort of endless cycle that never ends. Do you understand? The guy is desperate because he doesn't know if she's lying or not. Right. In fact, that was something that was never proven. Yeah. Exactly. So what you have to do is play that, that ambiguity, do you understand? Make us doubt whether or not you really had a bout of amnesia or if you just want revenge. Now, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying it's easy. Hmm? I imagine that it's something like, uh, 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 what is it you said? Give me the line. Uh, give, give me the li uh, line from the text. Which one? How about taking it from... Do it for the love you once felt for me. Yes. Let's see. Take it from there. Give me the line. Fauna! Please, forgive me. Do it for the love you once felt for me. Oh, please, don't be ridiculous. What is this love you're talking about? Ha! <laughs> love. How presumptuous. Fauna, it's me. What happened to you? What have they done to you? Sir, please, I'm begging you. If you insist on refusing me, I am going to have to kidnap you. So here's where something clicks. <laughs> we should be able to see that she understands or remembers something, even if it's just a glimmer. But we hadn't even gotten to that part yet. You cut me off before then. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> well, you were missing the bill, so let's do it again. <laughs> the director's not half bad, huh? <laughs> Why don't you do the whole thing without stopping, and that way Santos can watch and learn. I'm sorry, can I say something? I like this scene, okay? I've seen it's powerful to me in its own right, but what I don't understand, and I'm thinking of the film here, is why we have chosen such a peculiar moment in Fauna's life to start with, a moment that is clearly sad and traumatic, and shows her to be weak and confused. I'm sorry, Jose, I'm not, I'm not trying to undermine you, but wouldn't it be better to start from the moment that she begins to dress as a man and joins the poet circle? The moment she transforms into Fauna? Ah, that's also a possibility. Because it seems to me <laughs> that the story is beautiful and full of pathos, and I'm grateful to Louisa for sharing it, and it's useful for all of us to know, but I wouldn't use it to construct Fauna's character. It doesn't seem just. Well, that may well be, but it's beside the point. The episode reveals her to be vulnerable, not weak. It's what I like most about the scene. But she was only 15 years old, Jose Luis. Exactly. It's a fundamental anecdote. That she never wanted to tell again. Right, Maria Luisa? We have to respect that. Besides, it's not as if we're lacking anecdotes to choose from Fauna's life. We can make a six-hour film if we wanted to. It's a story Mama wrote. What is it? The one about amnesia. Mm. It's just a story. She told it to me as a story. But it's in her recovery notebooks. Did you read those notebooks? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they exist. Says who? Mama? I'm telling you, this story is a lie. <laughs> it's OK. Either way. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. But for the purposes of what we're doing here, it's not so important whether it's true or not. What do you mean? To me, it's crucial. Since when? <laughs> what do you mean since when? Since always. What are you talking about, Julia? God, to me, it's not the same if it happened to me or if it's something I wrote. Maybe it's something that happened to me, but precisely because it was an episode of amnesia, I don't, I, I don't remember it, and then they tell me about it, and I feel ashamed of myself afterwards. And the only way I can face the pain is through fiction, through the act of creating fiction. 
I think it's best if we leave it for today and continue tomorrow. I'm exhausted. I buried two horses today. <laughs> what? I'm the one who buried Lacey. Five. Terror. Sometimes I feel like these terrors try and keep us together. <laughs> what? what does that mean? Exactly that. It's like you treat me so badly that I can't leave you. I don't understand. Of course you do. If you loved me and I were free, you'd be afraid that I would leave. So you instill fear in me so that I can't do anything other than stay. Because I'm weak. I'm afraid. But that's not love. I still don't know what you're saying, but I know I don't like it. The image you create of me is almost always a negative reflection of who I am. And I'm left trying to change it back so that I can show you in reality I'm better than what you see. And this is how you keep me with you. This lack of something, this constant feeling of being deficient makes me stay, but in a state of panic. And on top of that, while I spend my time trying to satisfy you, something that I'll never be able to achieve, of course, because that's not what it's about, I'm unable to tell what it is or who it is that I myself desire. That's what I mean when I say that you keep me with you through terror. Because you throw back an unbearable image of me. And at the same time, you instill the feeling in me that no other person could see me differently and that I should be grateful that you're so willing to put up with me. You're crazy. <laughs> you see? No. No, I'm not crazy. You already told me you don't want us to have a romantic relationship, and I already understood. And also, what makes you think that I'd want to be with you here? Did you think that was a given? And really, what makes you think that I'm, I'm going to want to be with you at all? Why did you assume that? Hmm? Do you feel irresistible? There it is. You're harassing me. I'm harassing you. I'm harassing you. I'm harassing you? Please! You come here and you drag me into who knows what ridiculousness, spouting a bunch of nonsense, saying that I terrify you. Come on. That I bring out the worst in you. Seriously, sweetheart, are you even listening to the way you talk to me? You think you can say whatever you want to me? You're already out of sorts. Do you see what I mean? I'm not out of sorts. It's just you say the most ridiculous things. My God, I have a family. I'm not cut out for this shit. If we don't want to do this, let's not do this. Nobody's going to die. And this, what you're doing right now, you wouldn't call this terror. Julia, don't bust my balls. <laughs> Just let me work in peace. A true diplomat. What are you going on about? Nothing. You're the kind of person who will lash out if you feel hurt. Can we continue working? Why do you want to be my mother? I don't want to be your mother. I want to tell your mother's story. Which one? What do you mean, which one? The, the story of her life, her life story. Oh, her, her life. Not one of her stories, though. One of her, no, no, right. Her life. Right. Why? Because it's fascinating. It fascinates me, and I think other people will find it interesting as well. I want to make this film because I want other people to get the chance to know her too. Who? Your mother. But my mother is dead. <laughs> right, I know, that's why. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, let's start again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you start, pardon me, good sir. Yes.
What do you mean, my good sir? It is not my intention to inconvenience, my dear friend, but I cannot help but observe that there is a confluence of forces in you that I am unable to discern. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, my dear. Do me the favor of not taking offense at my impertinence. Of course not. Rest assured, proceed. Well, my blessed friend, allow me to be truthful and excuse my clumsiness, but I proceed with the best of intentions. I do not wish to take advantage of or squander your time, but believe me when I say I do not know how to begin. My beloved friend, I find that I am in love with you. What's wrong? What? Why are you threatened by me? Threatened? No. I, what do you mean, no? <laughs> really? <laughs> There's something that's bothering you. Down, my friend. At my side, you'll have nothing to fear. Be careful, Santos. The girl is becoming confused, and confused people are dangerous. Really? Louisa, do you think that running away, avoiding everyone, being different is an act of cowardice or one of courage? Are you saying that because of her? No, I'm saying that because of us. Here. Avoiding entanglement. Yes. I don't know. Depends on what your expectations or aspirations are. Fauna wouldn't be Fauna if she had shared her life with someone else. That's obvious. But do you think that makes her brave or the opposite? How is it possible for a woman to do everything she has to do and be a woman at the same time? <laughs> I don't understand. Is that poetry? <laughs> is that Fauna? No, it's mine. <laughs> what I'm asking is, what makes a woman a woman? Having or not having kids, being able to have them or choosing not to, why can't a woman gestate a child outside of her body, give birth to a child without finding out about it? Why must a woman always inevitably know? How can I be an actress and be in my body and be a mother? <laughs> How do I do it? How do I give my body to more than one thing? How can I split myself in two if I already do it all the time? Divide myself into another being, another living being. I'm selfish either way. Being a mother or choosing never to be one, it's unavoidable. I, I, I want to be a father to my children. I want to conceive them far away from me and not even know they exist. Or know they exist and not even need to see them all the time. <laughs> What determines whether or not I'm a woman and what makes me act this way? Why this obsession with always knowing and understanding what is what and who makes whom? I, I can't relate anymore to this expectation of weakness. I also feel weak. So you want to make a film about women's issues? <laughs> I want to be a father to my children. Donna was a father to us. <laughs> Can we try the confession scene with Fauno read by a man? Would you be willing to try it? If you think it will help? <laughs> yes. You start, pardon me, my dear sir. Yes. Pardon me, my good sir. It is not my intention to inconvenience my dear friend, but I cannot help but observe that there is a confluence of forces in you that I am unable to discern. I don't understand you, my dear friend. Do me the favor of not taking offense at my impertinence. No, of 
phone now, rest assured. Well, my blessed friend, allow me to be truthful and excuse my clumsiness, but I proceed with the best of intentions. I do not wish to take advantage of or squander your time, but believe me when I say I do not know how to forgive you, my friend. My beloved friend, I find that I am in love with you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who wrote it? I did. <laughs> Your founder was more feminine than mine. show us a short excerpt that Romina brought of her work when Michael gets back up to sleep. And actually, is this working? <laughs> I think so. Um, this okay. Um, so, uh, Romina, I believe that you wanted and to... And to say a few words as well, um, just to introduce the video. Yeah. Video. Yeah. yeah. So, first yeah. I say thank you very much <laughs> to the actors and the director. It was very... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the whole time... <laughs> All together, yeah, it passed it because it, these the um, two plays, um, Fauna uh, premiered in 2013 and uh, El Tiempo Todo Entero in 2010. Nine. Nine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's been a while I didn't see them and I never saw them in English. Um, but anyway, it, it, I could. Yeah, I could see the heart of the place, and um, it was very weird. It was, <laughs> it was better that it was in English, because then already there is a distance. But I, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was like a dream. Like, um, I was, <laughs> like, I was in New York, and they were doing parts of my plays, <laughs> but in English, <laughs> it was completely the dream. Like. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what you're going to see, it's, it's, the video is not good. It's only because I wanted to have some images of the play. Um, because I also did the mise en scène, the staging of the, um, of the plays. Um, and the first one you're going to see, uh, you didn't hear tonight. Uh, the name is Algo de Ruido Hace. I only have pictures from that because it was like <laughs> last century. Um, <laughs> it was 2006. But, yeah, but the good the good thing is that um, I always work in these three plays with the same actors. So that's why I also wanted to have the, the pictures so you can see them age. Um, and then there are some images of El Timbo Tontero. You are going to recognize him because of the, yeah, of the what you have seen today. And then is Fauna and uh, ah, there are some um, images of Cimarron, which is uh, from, um, not the last, but the anterior, the mm -hmm. anteultimo? Mm -hmm. Next to last. Second to last. Yeah, yeah. second to last, next, next last uh, play I um, wrote on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and there are no images of the last one who is playing now in 
Buenos Aires, but the, that one I wrote and, and staged with two other women, and Brenda talked about that. Uh, so that, that is what you are going to see. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, they always dance a lot. I love very much the, the using the music, as you have seen today also, and um, uh, also leaving the songs, most, almost the whole song, <laughs> where people are already like, is it going to finish now? <laughs> the whole song. <laughs> and, um, and they dance a lot. I love to see them dance. Thank you so much. Um, so we have time for a Q&A. Um, and I think it is in everyone's interest if we make it as open as possible. Um, so I have, I'm gonna start with a very general question um, for Romina, but I know that she's also really interested in hearing from the actors and the directors and their experience, right, in working with the plays. Um, so uh, very uh, generally, can you talk a little bit about how you started writing and directing theater? <laughs> um, I, but when I finished school, I, I entered the um, um, literature university um, but I, I only stayed a uh, few months. <laughs> um, I, I, th I thought I wanted to study literature uh, because I, li I like to write and to read, but then th uh, they, they needed something else um, from me all, uh, other than read and to write. And at the same time, I was doing acting classes, um, and I thought it was a hobby. Um, but when I left uh, the university, I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> and I only had my acting classes. Um, so it kind of started to be a profession, but I didn't chose this profession somehow, the acting professor. But then I, I went to schools, to acting schools, where they promoted a lot, um, that the actor also thought about the scene, or not only like memorizing um, texts on, and doing them, but also thinking about the scene and writing, and uh, a lot of times you, you looked at your partners and then you became a kind of director for some moments. And then, um, this is a phenomenon that in Buenos Aires exists a lot, that um, directors who write and write writers who direct, and I, I am one of them. And so I had this short go through the, the acting, and sometimes in cinema I still do. Um, but then I started, I, I always in theater worked, I never really studied, studied. 
um, after I, I did my first play, which is none of them, um, I, <laughs> I entered to a, write, a kind of writing school in Buenos Aires, um, which is only... <gasps> Okay, it's okay. We are alive. <laughs> she is all, also alive. Don't kill her. Don't kill her. Don't kill her. <laughs> Brenda threw it on me. Did you see it? <laughs> Mina, welcome to New York. <laughs> um, things have changed just a little bit since 2006. There I'm are cockroaches in Buenos Aires also. We have to survive. We have to survive. Everyone has to survive. It's okay. I, re I respect it. <laughs> Before this is over, please throw okay, anyway, a bug at me. You, you were yeah. acting as a hobby, and you made your first play, yeah. and then afterwards, yeah, this you was, went to a writing class? This was someone in my past <laughs> appearing. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and then, then yeah, uh, yeah, it's okay. It's under control. <laughs> uh, this is amazing. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, no, I, what I was saying was that um, then I, after having done the first play, I studied uh, for two years in a playwright school, um, but already I was doing it. And then I started to work with these actors. In fact, they called me um, for the first play, for Algo Ruido Hace, uh, which w you only saw the photos. Um, and that's the first time I wrote for them, and I d directed them, and then we did this other two plays with them. And then already I, I kind of um, came to this more classic way of writing a play for actors and then rehears rehearsing it. In the beginning it was not like that. Like I became more classic <laughs> on my way. Um, Thank you. I'm still recovering and mortified. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So it, with Algo, you developed it sort of in rehearsals with them? Or the the with first one? Yeah. Um, I always say yes, and Pilar, the actress in the play, she always, when we are together at a, at a speech or something, she says, no, 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 I came one day and I had written it. I don't remember that. I think we wrote it together somehow, and then I finally wrote it down, but that we we, we work together. I, th I think between her and me, there's the truth. So, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, so your recent play, Reynos, um, it premiered at the Sarmiento Theater um, just in October, is that yeah. right? Yeah. And, and that's the result of a collective collaboration with um, artists and friends, I believe, Agustina yeah. Munoz and Margarita Moltino. Can you talk a little bit about this experience of working collaboratively? And yeah. yeah. Um, it, uh, the, the, the punto de partida, starting point um, of, the, um, of this uh, play was the, um, a diary uh, Margarita found of her grandmother who lived in um, outside, well, not in Buenos Aires, in Córdoba. Um, in, uh, and she, she worked with her family, she worked the land at the beginning of the 20th century. And then it's very interesting because it's a woman who writes, but she, was, she wasn't part of a cultural... Um, uh, not even of a city, but not of a cultural movement, or, or she didn't want to be a writer or nothing. But she wrote and she registered her her daily life in in, in the um, uh, campo on fields and uh, how she worked the the um, the land. And it's very very interesting and nice written. And then she asked us, uh, Austin and me, we we started to read it only. Um, and then she, uh, there was this curator, Vivi Telas, uh, you talked about also. She asked Agustina if she had something in between her hands to do at, at the theater, and she talked to her about this thing we had <laughs> in our hands, and then we started to write the, the play. In the play, finally, <coughs> um, at some moments, the actors read parts of the diary, which is a little bit cut and paste, but it's always the... Um, the voice of this woman, of Leonor. And then we three, the three of us, we wrote, but um, we, have, we were together a lot, but then each of us wrote at her place in Google Drive. So we all saw the um, material of the other one. And then finally we, we were together physically and 
we worked on um, the, the um, material of the other one, like trying to edit the, the, uh, what the other one wrote. We gave free access to being intervened by the other one. And yeah, this was a, a very good process with them. And then with the actors, there are six of them. Um, none of the none of the, the the ones you saw here. These are, ah no, see Susana, the mother in El Tiempo Todo Entero and in Fauna, the woman, the curly woman. Um, <coughs> she is in this play, and we have three. You want, we have three generations. There are two not older women, but and two middle-aged women and two uh, younger guys. Um, but it's not a family. There are like beings. Um, and they talk a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, each time my plays go more to... Uh, there was a, a, a critic, some, someone wrote in, in the um, uh, titular. How is it? The headline was a play to watch with eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is, what? <laughs> and it was not even a bad critic, but... <laughs> what? For the actors, you know? A, a play to watch with <laughs> eyes closed? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> But somehow I, I share the idea because uh, I become each time more crazy. I sometimes watch it with my eyes closed <laughs> and I, I hear them. And there's something about the voices of the actors and the cadencia, uh, which I'm obsessed with. Um, also, when I, when I see my actors in other plays, I'm always like, well, oh, with their voices. Like, what are, are they doing there uh, somehow? <laughs> like, um, so, and this is very different from cinema, where you where the voice is recorded, no? The voice in a life is al al also when when somebody dies, you lose everything. But the voice is something you can never bring back, because recorded, it's not the same voice. You can see a picture, but the voice is, I don't know, it's life. <laughs> Thank you. I have a list of more questions here, but I'm wondering if um, anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, or maybe... Jean or April? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, Romina, uh, and thank you, everyone, for the for the show. That was really nice. Uh, I wanted to to ask you about the poetic texture of the speech uh, of the um, speech of Santos in Fauna, yeah. Yeah. and maybe about the translation too, because. Yeah, I love the, the horse monologue and the other one about identity and, and the one against Julia. And, and I'm, I was interested in, in, in that poetic texture and, uh, because now there's this Marina Clos who is uh, Tres Truenos, I don't know if you know her, it's uh, from Argentina, who is playing with that, Sara Gallardo also, Inés Ejuaz, and there are like several women working with a kind of uh, thing that is related to that, like a, I don't know if, if is the case, but a, like a fake, but not fake poetic texture that is related to um, the countryside, or and I was interested in that. Thank you. And in the translation difficulties of the. Yeah. I, I only say, say a brief thing so they can answer about the translation. But today when we met, uh, I asked them, "What did you do with the monologue of Santos?" Because um, yeah, it's written very poetically and um, arbitrary also in Spanish. It's not that it's a kind of way of speaking or something. It's poetic. Um, and, don, and then they, 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 say <laughs> they had worked a lot on that and they were still working on it. We are still working on it. Um, I think it is probably the hardest monologue yeah. in the play. Um, and I think it has precisely to do with that because it is sort of that pseudo poetic language. Um, so it both is pseudo, it is poetic, but it's also pseudo poetic. So it's very affected speech, right? And then you see sort of, um, you know, even um, you, it's explicitly stated that this is sort of an homage in a way to Horacio Quiroga. So you've got like, you know, that influence as well, um, right? And like, sure, all of these discourses of, um, you know, El Campo. Um, and so it is extremely complicated. And add to that also the issues we've had with um, trying to decide the tenses, right? Like past and present narration. So um, it is tricky. It was really helpful to hear it, um, extremely helpful. So uh, I think that we'll continue working it. Um, but April, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, part of the whole reason to 
to do this uh, sort of encuentro was, well, one, to be able to talk to Romina, but it was actually to hear the translations, even though we couldn't do the whole plays, but to spend you know two or three rehearsals um, with actors, like listening to the text. So Brenda was in rehearsal with us yesterday and we were changing words. And it's like super, super helpful. And also I think with Fauna, I think with any of the plays, it's not just the idea of um, what word choice do you use, but actually having the chance to like dig into the play itself, because the, plays, the play can be kind of opaque in a way and really figuring out, and we haven't, done this because we've only met three times, but to start to figure out like what's actually happening and what are the relationships and what's being picked up on and when, you know, when things are in repetition and what does that mean and then how the word choices that you use in English work. And so for the Santos monologue, for now we chose to keep it in English. I mean, sorry, in English, <laughs> in the present. <laughs> keep it in English. No, we, we chose the present tense to try as, a, as, a, as an experiment. Um, because I also thought there was something about, there's this sort of like heightened poetic piece that is sort of um, from literature. And at the same time, he shows up to audition for the film. So there's this sort of the poetics of the film, the visual that you wouldn't see, right? But here, and how do you translate that? And I think the rhythm is really hard. And I don't know if we've solved that yet, but that's something we've talked about. Like, what is the rhythm of the of the speech? Um, so yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And then it's narrating a traumatic event, and so there's also sort of like this dissociated feel in a way. Um, but there's so much going on; it is really complicated. Yeah, I feel. I don't know. How did you feel? No, I, I feel it's important that that it has a mu musicality. Does yeah. it exist? Because um, he he speaks about this humming, no, it's this humming of the bees, and everything he describes has this. He he gives these images, no, of the of the motor or something, no, um, like music musical. And also today, seeing him, also I thought, I. Santos is somehow what you were saying. Um, he is like playing for them. Also, he is playing the wild for these people who expect the wild. Yeah, that's what I. And yeah. because then, during the play, he turns out to be a completely <laughs> delicate person and very not rude at all. So you say, but who was the person in the beginning? Um, uh, and well, I don't know. I I think that. <laughs> yeah, he's ambiguous in the beginning. Yeah. Like there's, th yeah, for sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Great evening. Um, I think you had mentioned that you had the same three actors in like three different plays. And was that, did that just happen or is that a choice? And are you thinking of continuing with them? And if so, for how many decades? And questions like that. They became very famous. <laughs> so they left me. <laughs> Um, the one, no, um, yeah, we were like a group, um, we were a group, but already in Fauna, one of them left because he, um, uh, he said he left because he had a child, but the truth is he went to work to the TV, so both in the, at the same moment, but none of us was, had, had childs yet, so he said, I'm, my, my wife is pregnant, and we were like, Oh, okay, <laughs> we can't say anything because we didn't have children, so we couldn't say, that's an excuse. Um, <laughs> it was like, ooh, yeah, kid, yeah, no. <laughs> now you really have to work. But then we found out he wanted to work at, at the TV. So, um, <clears throat> and he still is, and he's very, very, very famous. He has like, I don't know, 4,000 million followers. I don't know what. Um, so um, with him, uh, he didn't do fauna. He was the one playing the director. And for me, it was really a pity because uh, that play, I wrote, I wrote every, everything specially for them. But that play, with all this role playing and all of them becoming vulnerable and doing things they do are not used to do. And for me, it was putting him in a very vulnerable position, precisely this character. And he couldn't do it somehow. So it was, mm, it was also the play where uh, Santos, who is Esteban, was um, more glowing somehow, and he was used to glow. I don't know. It's very it's very um, it's 
subtle. It's a lot of things. It's all together. But it was for me a pity. But and, and also the two men kissing in a moment. It was not, uh, I want to see men kissing on stage. It was these two men kissing. Yeah. So for me, it was <laughs> not the same, him or another one. Then when finally we did it with the other one, and <laughs> it was okay, but I didn't care about those men kissing. <laughs> um, but that was only <laughs> my thing. Nobody noticed that. Uh, no, but really, but theater is made of very uh, invisible energies, and they are there. Even if people don't know them, they know them. Um, so all, all of that is very... So uh, when he went, I was we, we were very depressed, and we thought, oh, we can go on. Let's drop everything. We have this fantasy. And then we just did it, and it was okay. Um, but after that play, um, we... I continued working with uh, Esteban, the one who played Santos. I did Cimarron, the, the last pl play you saw with him again and with other two women. And now in the in Reynos, uh, there is the mother playing. But I didn't uh, work again with Pilar and with the other Esteban. They, they are both, both called Esteban. But <coughs> now in February, we are doing in Madrid uh, El Tiempo Todo Entero again. Um, with the original cast, but not the girl, Pilar, not because now she is pregnant. Um, very, very pregnant, but uh, because otherwise she would do it. But imagine Antonia not going out and with <laughs> big pregnancy. Like, let's talk about that. <laughs> I don't do anything with them. <laughs> this belly, nobody talking about that. <laughs> this would be something. Um, so we do it with uh, three of the original and another one, another um, Maria Vichar, who is also a friend and an actress. Um, and this is also almost necessary because, um, yeah, now we are rehearsing and again, the, I, heard, I hear the texts and they say, they say them the same than before. And it's very hard to break that musicality and I don't know if you're going to do it or not, but already there's a new one who doesn't have the, the, this musicality and this already um, changes, it shifts everything, which I think it's necessary because we are 10 years older. So imagine the story with the <laughs> these old people. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Josefina, for asking me to work with you guys on it and everybody in the cast. And um, as somebody who really knows the Glass Menagerie a lot, I think it's probably a helpful opening gambit to say it's there is some connection to Glass Menagerie. But I, as much as I love Glass Menagerie, I find this play more interesting in many ways. Okay. And um, I'm just interested. Um, for you, is it really the starting point to sort of like have an argument with the Glass Menagerie or try to go beyond it? Or is that just like a beginning and is your engagement with the story and the characters really beyond that? Um, <clears throat> in the beginning, I wanted to do the Glass Menagerie uh, in Spanish and you have to pay a lot of money if you want to do so in Argentina. And I was not, I didn't have the money to do it. Um, and then, I don't know, I'm so crazy. And I said, I'm going to write the, the Glass Menagerie again, <laughs> somehow. Um, I don't know why I did that. Um, <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm not a Tennessee Williams fanatic. It's not that yeah. I wanted to make an homage or something. I like this place very, very, very much, um, reading it. And something, I, I, had to, I, pre I chose to prepare that play when I um, to, to come into the playwright school. So I had a um, relationship with the play. And then I read um, things Tennessee Williams said about the play and about his family situation. And um, apparently it's the most um, autobiographical play and it's him and it's his sister and all the lobotomy story and all of that. And um, I don't know, something of that, it touched me. Um, but of course, uh, I don't know why, I don't know. But then finally, when I had this play, I said, now what do I do? Because I couldn't say it wasn't the Glass Menagerie, and I couldn't say it was the Glass <laughs> Menagerie. <laughs> so I asked um, one of my teachers who had adapted the last version to sp in Spanish, read it, please, and tell me, how do I register this play? And then he said, 
well, it's your words. If you had to pay for an idea, you should pay, but this you can register at your, at, like, like your play. That's that, that I did. And finally, when we had the premiere, I wrote on the, on the paper that people got, um, sobre, I'll do about, okay. about the glass menagerie. Very, <laughs> <laughs> no idea, <laughs> about. Yeah. Um, and so because, and, and a lot of people who knew the play said, yeah, yeah it's like, it, it is the glass menagerie. And a lot of people who didn't know the play never connected and both, uh, both, both things are possible. Um, yeah. And uh, you said that uh, Tennessee Williams was very autobiographical yeah. when he wrote his play. Were you autobiographical when you wrote your play? Um, yeah, somehow, always. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for God's sake, in theater, it's less like obvious than when I write narrative, where it's completely obvious that it's <laughs> autobiographical. It's always a first person of a woman. <laughs> uh, who is this woman? Um, but um, yeah, but somehow, anyway, yes, always. I think you write something, even if it's situated in the with Vikings or whatever. It's always, yeah, autobiographical. Any other questions from the audience? Anybody else have questions? Um, it was mentioned that you recently did your first uh, feature-length yeah. film, and I guess I'm just curious about sort of what your experience was directing actors for stage then versus film and to what extent you were able to sort of preserve the methods you had honed for theater um, in the cinematic medium. Mm. Um, in the film, um, I tell all of you, <laughs> I play myself somehow, not, yeah, more than somehow, um, and there's my mother also and my son. They are not actors. And then there are some actors um, and so for the real actors, somehow I, I wrote for them. The, uh, the actors in the, in the movie are the, my A option. So I didn't really have to direct them because I knew what they could give me or what they could give or how they play or how they are. So in choosing them, there was for me already the direction somehow. So I didn't add too much to what they proposed. And with my son and my mother, for me somehow to be in the movie was also the way to direct them, which is impossible because they are not actors. Um, uh, but being myself in the movie and playing with them was the m way to direct them. But it was completely different than when I do theater where I am out outside and I talk to them and um, yeah, it was very different. But because in, in theater, they are, they are always playing someone else or something else. And in, in this movie I made, they needed to be themselves, all of them, even the actors. So I don't, I don't think I really directed them in trying to be someone else, someone else than themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to create the conditions for them to be themselves. Yeah, or I wrote for them. So already I know them when they play. I, I know them in, in the movies and I know them in theater. So um, I didn't have to, to tell them too much. And the same with your mother? Like, yeah. like, could she be herself? Like, that's what I mean. Like, did you have to work? Not that much. I didn't work that much with her. Um, I took over her place. <laughs> um, yeah, no, she and she played because there are two scenes, um, dramatical scenes, and one of them I take the line and she only responds to that, and the other one she is picking on me, and I thought, okay, no idea. Um, I had written the pl the the scenes they had written, and then we read them and um, we talked about them, but I didn't want her to to memorize them. Uh, to learn them th um, by heart. Uh, so she improvised on what was written. And uh, she was great. And she plays, she lies. Um, this one moment in the second one, she's concerned about, about how I'm raising the kid. And, and then she's picking on me. And at the end, 
uh, Ramon, the, the kid was supposed to be sleeping on the bed, and of course he wasn't there because he was three years old. It's impossible to make him sleep. And then we put a puppet there, a cupboard. <laughs> and when it finishes, she does like, she's like concerned, and she turns around and like pats on the puppet. <laughs> and me, I was like playing inside and saying, what is she doing? <laughs> and she was acting. She faked. <laughs> She faked, like touching her grandson. <laughs> and me, I was like completely nervous being the, the daughter, the director, the actress, everything. But yes, she lied. Yes, she faked. Well, if we, if we have time for another question, yeah. yeah? Um, so we were talking about this a little today, um, how you know in Argentina there has been this explosion in feminist thought and activism and sort of awareness of gender gender violence and Nuna Menos and all of these movements that are now transnational. Um, and it's it's interesting because um, I think that your work sometimes is interpreted with a feminist lens. But like, how how do you feel that your work sort of dialogues with everything with everything that's happening? I have no idea. In fact, today I, I was trying to to see the play and thinking, how does it relate exactly with the more um, established discourses now uh, on feminism, um, which is very 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 strong in in Argentina or in Buenos Aires at least. Um, but since then, the, the plays I wrote are very kind of less engaged with the, with the expression of these things, but all I try to have them already internally say that so that it's not something you have to say because it's outside. And in the play, for example, now in Reynos, um, they are like, they has, have kind of no sexuality and no, they are like genderless and, um, kind of timeless, not ageless, because a body has an age. Uh, but, and so, and they talk about other things, like work and um, politics, and I want to have that already like incorporated when I write fiction, and not to need to say things, because I, I, I think that belongs to another sphere now, to, well, maybe always, but. Um, um, you know, it's interesting, I think, I see them now, going back to these plays, I see them more in terms of gender fluidity than feminism, yeah. and, 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 and as a given, because I think you see it in both the plays that were had scenes staged tonight, which to me is really interesting, and, and, and it's kind of, you, you've, you've become historical, Ronin. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> It's good you remarked. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't know. I if, if I try to think like that in in no. the context, I get I go crazy. Oh, yeah. Like, why do people need to hear? Hear? What do I need to say in a in a in a present agenda or something? You know, it's really something that has to touch you and 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 you also. In the time I write a play and then I rehearse it, it's a long time, so I need to be, I can't do something too, um, now everything moves so fast, so I, I couldn't think of something happening at that moment or the next month or three months before. It's like, it has to be something more, um, um, subterraneo, um, subliminal uh, happening, more universal somehow also. Um, to be, to be, to survive the moment. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful work with Thank us. Thank you, all tonight. of you who did this Thank beautiful work. Thank you, to everybody. Thank you. And um, there's now a reception uh, right here. <laughs> so stick around. Thank you.